Jewish Museum of Florida, FIU. It is my pleasure to welcome you to FIU's annual Holocaust and Genocide Award this week. I'm John Mark, Executive Director of Hillel at FIU, the Jewish student organization that this year is celebrating its 100th anniversary internationally. And I'll be introducing uh, today's event, Building Bridges to Fight Racism, Anti-Semitism, and All Forms of Hate. Uh, before I introduce our speakers today, I'd like to uh, acknowledge this event's partners, the Lubick Family Foundation, Honors College, and the Greater Miami Jewish Federation. Uh, we're grateful for your contributions and to your participation in this event. Uh, I'd also like to thank uh, Professors Eric Isaac, who's here from that class. All right. <laughs> and uh, Dan Alvarez, who's here from that class. All right, good stuff for bringing their class today. Thank you for being here. Um, and now, our panelists, uh, Duma Sani Washington, founder and CEO of the International uh, of the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel, is also author of Zionism and the Black Church, and the creator of CUFI's Mizrahi Park, a short film project that tells the story of the over 850,000 Jewish refugees from North Africa and the Middle East. Morton A. Klein, national president of the Zionist Organization of America, is the child of Holocaust survivors and was himself born in a displacement persons camp in Gunzburg, Germany. He also marched uh, in the South in the 60s supporting civil rights. Gentlemen, welcome. It is great to have you. I, I want to start off by just uh, uh, something we, uh, we had an email exchange uh, pointing out that uh, last Friday, my, my synagogue in, in Aventura Temple, Sinai, uh, had an, an MLK Shabbat, and we welcomed uh, a local church, and their pastor gave a sermon, and the choirs, uh, you know, g uh, got together, and there, there was uh, not an empty seat in the house, uh, and, uh, a great mix of uh, Jewish Americans, Black Americans, and it is, it, it, you know, sometimes we can get, uh, you know, negative and, and feel like maybe things aren't as good as they are. But uh, when I see something like that, I, I am very hopeful. And I, so I just want to start with that, knowing that like, this, this conversation today is a path towards a, a, a better future uh, for everybody. Um, so with that, uh, before we, we go into how we, we're saving the world here, um, <laughs> tell us a little bit about yourselves and, uh, personally, how you grew into the leaders you are today, and about the work you do with your individual organizations. Well, I started the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel in the summer of 2013. And this was a. Microphone up? Yeah. There you okay, go. Okay, there we go. I started the IBSI Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel the summer of 2013. A few months after my first trip to Israel in 2012, I was one of the African American pastors' tour uh, in 2012 with Christians United for Israel. Wasn't on staff, didn't know much about the organization. Uh, came to learn more and even served on staff there for a while. I started IBSI a year before that. Uh, is, as I tell our, our clergy and, and other church members is what I can only describe as a, a real uh, intense uh, desire to strengthen the alliance between black and Jewish community in Israel and Africa. They were one and the same. And this happened while I was at the hotel uh, in the, the Western Mall. Jerusalem, I brought it back, shared it with our congregation, talked to them, talked to my family about it. Didn't know how I was going to do it, had no idea how I was going to start that journey. Uh, began to put the pages together of my book, Zionism in the Black Church, which actually was published, the first edition in 2014, the second one that's out there now was published in February 2021. One of the things that inspired, of the many things that inspired our organization was in my research, finding out about, among many other things, a 1975 organization founded by black Americans entitled Black Americans to Support Israel Committee, BASIC. It was founded by Dr. King's former friends and family members. He had been assassinated, of course, in 1968 by a Rustin, A. Philip Randolph were the main spearheads behind it. The members included people like his father, Martin Luther King Sr., uh, Martin King Sr., uh, Coretta Scott King. And it was formed for two reasons, number one, to fight against the Israel hatred and anti-Semitism that was encroaching both in the United States and internationally. And number two, to defend what we call in our organization the Black Historic Struggle for Justice. In 1975, those of you remember, the UN passed a resolution which was 3379, Zionism is a form of racism. And it was black leaders in the United States who took umbrage to that, not only because it was not true, 
but because it was actually a, a pilfering of what the actual racism was that was experienced by those who fought Jim Crow segregation, and then later on, those black South Africans who fought against apartheid. So that was part of the inspiration. And we, uh, we, we were not dormant, but we were so much mostly writing in, in, in an educational resource for several years. My son is now the executive director. While I was on staff with Coop, I returned to this organization full time in May 2021, and now we are actively uh, doing the work across the country and just returned from South Africa with our what we call Ipsy Ambassadors, which is a two pronged trip. In December, we've traveled to the motherland, and in June, we will go to the Holy Land this coming June, and they are learning this story hands on, both in Israel and in Africa, and we look forward to continuing to doing that very soon. Great. Yes, sir. Uh, well, I'm Morton Klein. <clears throat> uh, I am a child of Holocaust survivors, born in, in Germany in a deep displaced persons camp. My parents are survivors of Auschwitz, one of the notorious murder, murder camps uh, in Europe at the time. <clears throat> My father lost his entire family, eight brothers and sisters, his first family, his first wife, uh, all cousins, grandparents. I grew up without any grandparents. Uh, <clears throat> And we came to this country when I was four, that's why I had a minimal accent, actually no accent. <laughs> and uh, we were very poor. Uh, we lived in all black neighborhoods, not upper middle class black neighborhoods, not middle class, really poor black neighborhoods. All my friends were black. Uh, and we had a great time. We played ball all the time. And uh, there were some aspects of it that weren't so wonderful, but basically it was great. <laughs> and. Uh, then I went to high school, and after uh, uh, I, studied, I studied mathematics and statistics in high school, in the college at Temple University, I got a graduate degree in that field, and I went to work in the federal government. I was an, econ I was an economist, a mathematical economist, uh, doing health policy for many years. Uh, uh, then I also worked for the greatest chemist who ever lived, a two-time Nobel Prize winner. Uh, his name is Linus Pauling. Uh, in chemistry, did uh, a lot of work in nutrition and disease. When I did medical research, people always praised my work and said nice things to me. Now that I got involved in this Arab-Israeli situation, uh, things have changed. <laughs> it's become very political. <laughs> and uh, my wife started complaining to me that I'm not doing anything for my people, that Israel is getting bashed in the media, they're lying about Israel and Jews all the time. You should do something I didn't know anything about. Israel, look, I cared about it, I was a Jew. <laughs> so I studied, uh, I read many books, many articles to, uh, uh, to teach myself about it. <laughs> and then to make a long story short, I started becoming an activist on my own. I, I changed anti-Israel textbooks, anti-Israel travel guides, anti-Israel university programs, <laughs> and other such things. And, and successfully got, got these things changed. I became sort of locally in Philadelphia, people became aware of my work since uh, we, I was effective in getting these things changed. <laughs> and uh, a group from the Zionist Organization of America came to me and said, we want you to run for president of our organization. ZOA is the oldest personal group in the United States, founded in 1897. Past presidents include Louis Brandeis, uh, who will remember the Supreme Court. <laughs> so they came to me, I said, I don't know how to be president, and I don't want to be president. <laughs> and they said, you, the odds are you can't win, they are not known as ZOA, but we think if you run, you'll make the incumbent president uh, more activist. So I said something uh, no politician will ever say. I said, look, if you promise me I won't win, I'll run. Because <laughs> 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 I, no, I wanted no part of this. But uh, as is my want, I, uh, I worked hard as if I wanted to win, and I won by 17 votes out of almost 1,000 cast. And I became president. And uh, <laughs> I'm, uh, uh, they said you just have to be president for a year or two. It's uh, it's now 29 years. I've wow. been the oldest serving president ever of the organization, which is you know 125, 130 years old. <laughs> we were instrumental in getting the embassy moved from uh, uh, Tel Aviv, the U.S. embassy, to Jerusalem. Uh, I went to said whole story. I won't get into it. I went to Senator John Tile, who was one of the great friends of Israel uh, from Arizona. And we put, the, uh, 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 we put the legislation together to move it. And amazingly, no Jewish organization supported it. They thought this will upset the Arabs. It'll make peace impossible. Uh, and so we did it on our own. And uh, we only had seven or eight members of the Senate on the bill. 
And John Kyle said, look, I'm gonna go to Bob Dole. Robert Dole then was the majority leader of the Senate from Kansas. Uh, so we went to Bob Dole, we asked him to get on the bill, uh, and when he got on the bill, went from eight to 35 senators out of 100. And as soon as we had 35 senators, suddenly the other Jewish groups started getting on board. They were afraid that ZOA would get full credit. They wanted part of this if this really happens. Uh, uh, the bill was passed overwhelmingly, uh, but uh, there was a, a clause, a, a, a waiver in the bill, a security waiver, where the president could say, for security reasons, I'm not moving it. Every president for 18 years invoked that security waiver, so it was not moved. Uh, Democrats and Republicans both uh, invoked it until Donald Trump finally moved it. Uh, everyone told him, do not move it. It's going to cause rioting and violence all over the Middle East. It's going to be a nightmare. He did it anyway because it was the right thing to do, and it was U.S. law. And there was no violence and no rioting. Uh, so uh, there was no reason to have that fear. <laughs> Uh, and finally, my other a big achievement is that we got Title VI, which is the uh, of the Civil Rights Act, to not only include, not only cover minorities, but finally to cover Jewish people as well. So, if Jewish people are discriminated against or harassed in college, we can file complaints under Title VI. Um, and I guess, uh, I guess the only other thing I wanted to say is I was uh, uh, all city third baseman in the Little League in Philadelphia. <laughs> and if I wasn't observing the Sabbath, I probably would have ended up being in the major leagues, but the, the Sabbath uh, ended that career. Anyhow, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, guys. Um, I think we're at an interesting time in this country um, for anybody under a certain age. It, it feels like anti-Semitism and racism are are higher than what they were used to prior. Obviously, there's throughout history things have changed back and forth. Um, in, in your opinion, what, what has changed through American history, and what is what is the state of where we are right now? Well, of the many changes, probably let's just say the last <coughs> 60 years would be the evolution and the advent the evolution of social media. Um, that can be understated. There is a reality and there is a virtual reality. Um, sometimes they get mixed and confused, um, but that's where we are. And then I start by saying that because there is a difference between what's rhetoric, what's being said, and what's actually happening on the ground. For me personally, uh, having done this work in terms of black, Jewish, Israel, Africa, all the area for close to the last decade or so, I've had the privilege of traveling the country and having real world conversations with real people, not just on Twitter and Facebook and Instagram. And I can tell you that the reality is starkly different than what happens, unfortunately, in social media. We are in a difficult time. We absolutely are. But those two things are absolutely connected. I have the privilege of speaking with rabbis and black pastors, community leaders uh, from both communities doing amazing work in cities across the country, Chicago, LA, um, Orlando, um, and others. And when I say doing work, in a very organic way. Um, so in keeping with the question, I think that what's happened, among many other things, is that you have extreme voices on both sides of whatever the issue would be, and this would be racism, anti-Semitism, <laughs> that are so amplified that it is affecting discourse in real time. Right? Um, and it's affecting attitudes, it's affecting understanding. Uh, people who are taking strong positions about things and they don't really have facts or information. They have this tweet or this thing, and I'm not being disparaging about you can get information from social media, but it's hard to do a deep dive on a post, right? So they have to go a bit further than that. And that's much of, when, when I see some of the clashes that are happening, uh, where media is concerned and things are being said, it often is a lot of misinformation being shared in traffic and the argument being around something that wasn't even true in the first place, but now we're fighting about it, right? So I think that that has much to do with tensions, that has much to do with levels of anti-Semitism, types of discrimination that's actually happening, both on our college campuses and in the broader society. So I think that's the biggest thing that's changed is media. <laughs> I hope I'm answering your question. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. <laughs> well, uh, as you see, I have notes. I do not have the intellectual prowess of Pastor Washington. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, Jews and blacks uh, have both experienced similar prejudices throughout the uh, history, certainly throughout American history. <laughs> uh, 
We both, uh, both Jews and blacks weren't allowed in certain hotels and restaurants. And many times signs would say no colored, no Jews, no dogs. Uh, 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 blacks were horrifically lynched uh, in the South for being black. Some Jews were as well. We didn't have the same type of prejudice as blacks had to endure because we, uh, most of us have white skin, so we could, uh, people couldn't identify us as Jews immediately. <laughs> we had trouble getting jobs. Uh, uh, just like blacks did. There were quotas on Jews in universities, at law firms, at, at hospitals, or many hospitals wouldn't allow a Jew to work there. <laughs> That's one of the reasons Jews started their own hospitals, uh, in order to have, for Jewish doctors have a place to work. Uh, <laughs> we both endured slavery, blacks in America, Jews in Egypt uh, several thousand years ago. Uh, so Jews and blacks really have an affinity. We have such an affinity, and Judaism teaches us uh, to pursue justice and, and to be just and fair. It's powerfully ingrained in us as Jews. And so uh, when we saw the horrible injustice being perpetrated against black people, it is Jews who started the NAACP. Most people don't know this. Jewish people started the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People. You're allowed to say colored people these days? That's the name of the organization. That's the name. So, yeah, you, they should. They got to change. Uh, 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 Joel Spingarn was the first president of Professor Columbia University. Uh, Stephen Wise, president of, uh, of ZOA, was on the board of NAACP in the very beginning. And Jews uh, were the biggest funders to NAACP for decades. For decades. Uh, Jews also were heavily involved in starting the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, the Urban League. Uh, all sorts of human rights uh, uh, groups for blacks. Uh, Julius Rosenwald, a very famous wealthy Jewish businessman who started Sears Roebuck and Company, uh, uh, contributed huge amounts of money to establish black colleges and black schools. 5,000 black schools, 20 black colleges, including uh, Howard University, Dillard, and Fisk. Uh, most people, most blacks, I don't think even know this, uh, how intimately involved uh, Jews were in the, in the black struggle. <coughs> In fact, Jackie Robinson, the great uh, uh, baseball player, the first black in, uh, that was allowed to play in uh, Major League Baseball, he became very close friends with Hank Greenberg, uh, the great uh, uh, Jewish slugger uh, uh, from Detroit, because both of them experienced discrimination. Again, I don't want to make it seem like it's equivalent. It's not. Jackie Robinson experienced much worse discrimination than Greenberg, even though Greenberg also uh, faced discrimination as a Jew. Uh, uh, Jews were the first ones to really hire blacks without uh, work, thinking about the color of their skin. Benny Goodman was the first major musician to hire blacks in his band, uh, I think in the 30s. Uh, it was well known that blacks could go to Jewish stores and could try on clothes. Other stores run by white people would not allow blacks to try on clothes. Jews did, because it was so unjust, so unfair. It was ingrained to us really from our Torah, from our Bible, uh, about the, uh, how important justice is. <laughs> And Jews were, the big, were among the biggest supporters of Martin Luther King. March with King, helped fund King. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, there were three, uh, the famous case of three uh, activists, civil rights activists, who were murdered by white racists in the South. Two of them were Jewish. Uh, Michael Schwerner and Andrew Goodman were murdered along with James uh, Cheney. <laughs> and when, uh, when uh, finally a case was brought by the NAACP, uh, Black versus uh, Board of Education, uh, to ensure that blacks would be allowed to go to schools just as whites could any schools. Uh, one of the, the major lawyers in that case was Jack Greenberg, a Jewish lawyer, uh, was in that case. <laughs> so we really had a great relationship fighting for each other's rights and uh, helping each other, uh, and things started to change. Uh, lately, I certainly agree with Pastor Washington that social media, uh, which, as you so correctly say, amplifies uh, hatred, uh, 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 like we never could before. Uh, but we had the, uh, what arose were uh, uh, black Muslims, uh, Elijah Muhammad, uh, Louis Farrakhan became very prominent. I mean, Farrakhan, of course, called Judaism a gutter religion, uh, that synagogues are, are, are the devil's place, the Satan's place. Hitler was a great man. Jews are the ones around the slave trade, which is completely false. Jews caused 9-11. And other black leaders like Tony Martin, these are professors, you probably don't know the names, Professor Tony Martin, Leonard Jeffries, and others in universities started spewing incredible hatred toward Jewish people. And I think in part this was inspired by Louis Farrakhan. Now why would this happen in the last several decades? 
when before we worked so closely together, Jews and blacks. And I think, <laughs> I saw a quote in the Bible, uh, chapter 1, uh, uh, verse 8 in Exodus. It said, a new king arose in Egypt who knew not Joseph. Joseph was a Jew who was one of the leaders of Egypt and helped save them from starving and just really saved the entire uh, country. Uh, and then, uh, decades later, the Egyptians enslaved the Jews. And the Bible teaches us they forgot that Jews were there helping Egypt and there's need to be. Uh, and I think that some of these leaders, many of these leaders and others have forgotten, don't know, or ignore the fact that Jews were such an important force, I'm proud of it, to help, to correctly help uh, the unjust and horrifying treatment of black people. Uh, and, uh, and then we, uh, comes along Jesse Jackson, Al Sharpton, uh, and such. And people don't think about this. They got huge amounts of money from Arab countries to promote hatred against the Jewish state of Israel. Uh, Farrakhan got $5 million from Gaddafi. Jesse Jackson was in the Middle East all the time visiting with Arab countries. Uh, it's been told that he also got large amounts of money uh, uh, to promote this, <laughs> promote hatred toward the, toward the Jewish state, the state of Israel. And uh, <laughs> so I think that, that that's really uh, what changed. Farrakhan has had, uh, unfortunately, Farrakhan is one of the greatest orators I, I think I've ever heard. Jesse Jackson is also one of the greatest orators. Uh, this has had uh, great influence on people, especially on uh, black entertainers, especially rap artists, who were not as sophisticated as uh, former black entertainers like Nat King Cole, who happens to be my favorite singer. What a voice. And, uh, 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 and, and uh, so now once these prominent black entertainers and athletes, uh, listening to Farrakhan and the Jacksons and the Sharpens and such, make horrible statements against Jews, it's had tremendous influence. And that's, I think, one of the reasons we've come to this uh, terrible time uh, with the black anti-Semitism uh, that was rarely seen many, many decades ago. Um, I, I want to give you sort of an opportunity to, to respond to that. But with that, I, I think, um, and from both of you, I, 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 would, I wonder if we can look internally at our own communities and say, well, well, what can we do better moving forward also? So much of what Mark is saying, um, we as an organization unpack and deal with writing, speaking, those type of things. And they can be very, very controversial and difficult subjects, but what we found in our organization that those are the subjects that need the most addressing. So again, I want to reiterate that we're able to have these conversations across the country, in churches, in community centers, with black leaders, with the pastors, with the civil leaders, as well as the Jewish community. And one of the, I'll just pick one, I don't want to dominate it, we can keep going. One of the issues that Mort just mentioned has to do with the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. You mentioned Jesse Jackson's role, Louis Farrakhan's role in that. We can, I'm, I'm separating that just for a quick moment from the just anti-Semitism of some of the statements and speeches. I, I talk about that in my book as well. Part of what became, the, in my, our opinion, I say for our organization, probably the thorniest, most consistently revisited issue when it came to both the Jewish community in the states, and then of course where the Middle East was concerned was Israel-Palestine. Okay? And this is particularly in the late 1960s, and again, many people aren't aware of it in terms of history, that Dr. King, who was speaking largely for the vast majority of the civil rights community, was speaking against anti-Semitism and anti-Zionism, not just out of a <laughs> desire to do so. He was pushing back against the rhetoric and against the, the canards, against the things that were being said. The biggest difference between then and the late 1960s is now is those things that were being said, that Israel was a settler colonial state, that Israel was imperialist. These things are being codified in the late 60s. And as these things are being said, Dr. King and some of the other civil rights leaders are being called on to speak because of their prominence, not just in the black community, but on a world stage. So as this is happening, Dr. King ironically assassinated April the 4th, 1968. Yasser Arafat takes chairmanship of the PLO in 1969. 
And what is the first thing that Yasser Arafat begins to do in terms of his outreach? He goes to what was already being called the militant wing of the young civil rights leaders, the Angela Davises, the Eldridge Cleavers of the Black Panthers, the Stokely Carmichaels. And what does he do? He comes there and he says, the way that white people, white races are treating you is how these Israelis are treating us, Arab Palestinians. Therefore, your lot is in with us. Now, that's a very powerful statement that would need to be unpacked, and this has been going on for the last 50 plus years. Because the same man who is saying that to them, who is receiving over the decades billions of dollars in international aid, while his people continue to be in poverty and continue to use young people as fodder in wars, these things are not being discussed. What's being discussed is what he's placing on the table in the United Nations and the media. Why do I connect to the black community? Well, it was never a broad attitude in the black community, but it was directed at leaders. So most of the spokesmen began to echo some of the same things that the PLO and later the PFLP, Popular Liberation Front for the Palestinian Organization, as they began to do work, including terrorism, including the the uh, the hostages that were hijacked in 1976 by German and Arab Palestinian hijackers who then take their plane to Entebbe Airport, where Idi Amin is the president, and that whole thing. What it begins to do is artificially pit Africans against Israelis or blacks against Jews in a narrative that would often not be unpacked in terms of its truth. So this part, I want to address that part. As that became the default position of many in academia, some in clergy, what default position? That there is one narrative, and that narrative is that these Israelis aren't even real Jews, came, I'm not saying this was being said, came from Europe, came from Poland, stole the pal Palestinian land, and that's what they've actually done, similar to what happened in the United States in terms of colonialism. That has been repeated so often that it is Bible for many people. How did that become Bible? They sold it first to some black leaders who, when they said it, because of the credibility that they had, it would get repeated over and over again. And then it became, you weren't a poor, true person of justice if you didn't have this default position. I'll say one last thing. I was just on the phone on a Zoom call two days ago with a black um, leader um, in a, uh, one of the schools in the Midwest. And I've been having these conversations more and more lately. We've been doing this for a while, but especially this last year, I think all these different things that are happening, the anti-Semitism we're talking about in the media. And this gentleman said to me, what I'm hearing more and more, particularly in academia and other areas, this black male leader is talking to me. He doesn't, as far as he's concerned, have what we call a dog in the fight, right? He doesn't consider himself pro-Israeli or pro-Palestinian. His, his issue as an academic is that he wants people to be able to come together, even debate, have discussions. His concern is that there is a one default, what I'm saying to you as a person who both supports Israel, a person who also often underscores the Palestinian human rights abuses that are happening in Gaza, that are happening in the West Bank, he doesn't bring that purview. He, as an academic, is, is lamenting the fact that he reached out to me because he saw some of the work that we were doing. Mind you, he did not reach out to me because I have an organization called the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel. We have some mutual friends, and he heard about what we're doing. He wanted to have a conversation about the lack of nuance or even debate on his campus. In other words, if there's even a statement that says, here is an explanation of the Israeli side of that story. That gets shut down with a vengeance. His concern is not that Israel is not being represented well, mind you. His concern is that there's no two sides of the debate. There's no discussion. And I'm hearing this again from people who don't have a side in it. This is what we're hearing oftentimes from black leaders. And I explained to him the same way. How did it become a default position? I walked him back to the 60s and brought him to today and explained to him some of why we are here today. So, and then you said something else, sir. So, uh, <laughs> so that's great. Oh. Oh, oh, yeah, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Did I, did I well, John had said another, it was a two part, but I didn't want to. Oh, that's, that's okay. So I'll, I'll keep him moderating. Sure. <laughs> yeah. I want to say it's very interesting about uh, uh, black Hebrews claim that they're the real Jews, that we, Jews are not the real Jews. And I would stop them in the street when they had the you know, placards and whatnot, black Hebrews. And I would say, if you're the real Jews, it's fine with me. 
But why aren't, don't I see you in synagogue on Saturday? Why aren't you keeping kosher? Why aren't you fasting in Yom Kippur? What kind of Jews are you? You're not following anything uh, that Jews are supposed to follow. So this makes no sense to me. And if they say they're the real Jews, no problem. Be Jewish. We, we would like more Jews. There's no, there's no problem whatsoever. And we like black Jews because Israel is the only country in the world that ever went and grabbed black people from one country, brought them to Israel, not to be slaves, but to be a free and prosperous people. That's the Ethiopian Jews. So when you go to Israel, you see black Jews all over the place. But those black Jews are wearing yarmulkes, going to synagogue, keeping kosher, praying three times a day. So I never understood this black Hebrew thing. And these black Hebrews, of course, have committed terrible violence uh, against Jewish people in, 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 uh, in New York and New Jersey. <laughs> So that, that, that always really uh, troubled me about this uh, black Jew business. By the way, I never use the term West Bank. I only say Judea and Samaria. That's been the, the, the name of that area. That's, um... no. <laughs> this is Israel. Okay. Just, uh, well, just, uh, uh, this is Israel. This area is, is referred to frequently as the West Bank. In the Bible, and until 30 years ago, it was referred to Judea and Samaria. <laughs> and we Jews are called Jews because we're from Judea. Jew is a contraction of the word Judea. That's where we're from. <laughs> Go ahead. Um, I do love the Israel conversation. I think it's very important. Well, let, let me just say, yeah. I think one of the big reasons there's been an increase in anti-Semitism in the world, and maybe among the black community, is because of the lies that have been perpetrated against the Jewish state of Israel. So people think that Israel is an apartheid state who stole the land, who murdered our babies. These lies about the Jewish state, uh, I think, has caused an increase in hatred toward Jews because of what these people falsely believe about the Jewish state. And that's why the Jewish state, I think, has a role in this discussion. Go ahead, sorry. Well, what do you think the, uh, the Jewish people in America, the Jewish Americans, can do to, for, uh, as their part, to, to better uh, relations? You know, because it, like you said, it seems like we should be strong allies in, you know, in uh, fight for equal rights and fights for, you know, all, everything. Um, so, what can the, what do you think the Jewish people can do to, to uh, improve the relationship? Well, I think one of the things, uh, since I'm a Jew, I guess I should. Be the yeah. <laughs> Uh, <coughs> is we need a, more of an education uh, uh, to the black community about what the Jews did and helped, how the Jews helped correctly black people uh, for a hundred years, uh, from starting the organizations to funding them, to doing everything good, to marching for civil rights, which is the right thing. It was not a special favor of the blacks. It was the right thing to do, according to the, the, the Jewish Torah, the Jewish Bible. <laughs> so we need more blacks to understand how intimately involved Jews were in fighting for justice for black people, in civil rights for black people. Most blacks don't know this. I think even black leaders don't know this. I think many pastors don't know this. <laughs> we have to educate people uh, uh, about that. And, and, uh, and I hear many blacks condemning Israel, uh, the Jewish state, as an apartheid state, which, which calls, causes them to have enmity toward uh, Jewish people. And this is one of the grotesque lies about Israel. That's an apartheid state. Uh, when Israeli Arabs have the identical rights, voting, political, uh, social rights as Israel, they vote in every election. 10% of the Israeli uh, Knesset parliament uh, are, are Israeli Arabs. Uh, there's an Israeli Arab uh, on the Supreme Court. Uh, uh, the last government of Israel, before this one, there was an Arab party in, within the government of Israel. Those sorts of things never happened uh, uh, in South Africa. So this is one of the grotesque lies, and black people that I know have this enmity toward Jewish people because they think the Jewish state is discriminating against uh, Arabs, just the way South Africa discriminated against blacks, and it's one of the big lies uh, uh, that have been endured now uh, uh, for the last uh, several decades. So um, we have to teach people uh, that and other truths about the Jewish state. I, uh, I have a feeling, I mean, and, and the students can correct me later if I'm wrong, that, that uh, the majority of young people really don't care about all those details, right? And I, and I, and I also think there's a disconnect when we, you know, ever we, we always show Martin Luther King Day, we show photos 
of, of uh, you know, the rabbi with, with Martin Luther King. And I feel like today that, for lack of a better word, people don't relate to it. People don't, they, they don't, young people don't care about that. Do you think um, there's something else at play? Do you think um, some of it is subconscious? Um, you know, people just don't know don't know what they don't know, and so it, the the instinct is to lead with the negative. Do you think do you think any of that is at play? I think you have a generational uh, thing, and, and, and more of it was several different things. I'll, I'll just touch on a couple of them, but I'll start from the university. Uh, again, in the real world, and working and doing this across the country, generally pastors, black leaders of a certain generation, maybe 50 and up or so, they are very aware of the history of Jews in the civil rights struggle, the type of things. As a matter of fact, I'll do presentations, we'll talk, and, and not only in terms of the audience or the congregation, but the conversations afterwards, right? The younger generation is not as aware, right? But that's not particular in terms of African American. That has to do with just education in general. Um, that and my wife and I are both educators, and both in the public system and in homeschool, charter school. Uh, so we've had this experience that, generally speaking, when it comes to many topics, including history, there's a lot that's not. There's Americans who don't know American history, right? So the, when you come to things like the intricacies of the Jewish community's involvement in the civil rights movement, in the Jewish Rosenwald, Booker T. Washington was his main counterpart. And there's people who don't know Booker T. Washington is, or why they should know who he is, right? Unless they grew up in a certain uh, venue, if you will. They're not aware, and these things aren't taught in school, right? So that has a lot to do with it, the, the lack of the information that's available so that people can have things in context, right? But what also becomes the issue, and now your original questions of what, what the black community, Jewish community can do, I let more answer the Jewish community one. Um, so part of what's, uh, part of the issue that we are facing, along with lack of information, right? I wanna, I wanna give a little context here, back up. One of the things I talk about in my book, Zionism in the Black Church, is about Tulsa Black Wall Street, the race massacre of 1921, May the 31st, June the 1st, how the racists in the broader city completely destroyed what was called affectionately Negro Wall Street. It wasn't the only Negro Wall Street. There were several across, across the state of Oklahoma and across the country. It was Booker T. Washington who actually coined the term Negro Wall Street, Black Wall Street. So what we found in our education and the things that we do, for example, that most people, black or white, are there's two things that they know about Black Wall Street in Tulsa. Number one, nothing. Or number two, that it was destroyed in 1921. I never did it scientifically, but I would imagine that it's got to be around the 80, 90 percentile of people who don't know that it was rebuilt less than two years later by the same, by the survivors who owned the land. And when they rebuilt it, it was bigger and more prosperous than it was. Don't get me wrong, I'm not saying it was good, it was destroyed, it was completely horrific. And as a matter of fact, they have still not been paid reparations, right? You know, all the, the, the discussion of reparations, there's actual measured amounts of what was destroyed and what it would cost now. And they were paraded in front of Congress a couple of years ago. But there's still you no know, legislation that was passed because they have all the receipts of what was actually destroyed. It was rebuilt and continued to thrive until the 1960s, what actually dismantled it, among other things, integration. Now, the integration is bad, but when, it, when the black community had the freedom to, some of them chose to leave some of these areas that had been historically black since the early 1900s, since shortly after, 19, after the First World War. Why am I saying all that? This creates the vacuum that not only is there not context, but what gets poured into that hole is propaganda. Things like Mark was saying, if the Louis Farrakhan says, the Jews are responsible disproportionately for the slave trade in America, not only is that not true, it's been repeated so many times, people assume it as true. We have the receipts for all of this, what the percentage of the Jews who actually, who the Jewish abolitionists were, right? Who are the ones, as Mark said, at the turn of the century, helped establish the NAACP because there's such a vacuum of information. It's what creates things like discrimination, hatred, or gives even more rise to things like anti-Semitism, right? So if someone can stand up and say the Jews are responsible for this and the Jews are doing that and there's no other information there, it just gets accepted, right? And again, those things that were more 
And the reason why I connected it to the state of Israel, not even making it about Israeli policy and conflict, but I was connecting it to the anti-Semitism because now you have a foundation for some of these anti-Jewish things being said, and then Israel becomes the default illustration of why all those things are true, right? And it just becomes accepted. Of course Israel's committing genocide against Palestine. That's completely not true, but it's been said so many times that it's accepted. Why? Because this Jew in Brooklyn is doing X, Y, and Z, therefore these Jews in Judea and Samaria, these Jews and in, in novelists, these Jews, they're doing X, Y, and Z, right? And so on and so forth. This becomes, again, the default position academically to the point that if, if you even offer another narrative, another discussion, even if you have information about it, it gets dismissed. So for us, the number one, us being the Institute for Black Solidarity with Israel, our number one issue is education. Not just black Jewish education, black history. Understanding, I, there's a, um, I had to preach a sermon a couple of years ago at a friend's church, and as I talk now, I do extemporaneously, so I get in a lot of trouble, but you know, whatever. So I was saying to the people that far be it from me to accept a victim status from a people who suffered centuries of slavery and another gen century of Jim Crow segregation yet still built it like Wall Streets, still established academic <clears throat> centers, still established the Harlem Renaissance, soldiers who fought in every war since the Revolutionary War. And I would tell them, I descended from superheroes. One of the many things that we have in common with our Jewish brothers and sisters who come together at the, high, the holy day seasons and they repeat something along the lines of, in every, in every generation there have been those who've risen up against us to destroy us, but the Holy One, blessed be he, he has sustained us. Who could say that more than my people? Why were we singing Go Down Moses on the slave trade? Why were we singing Joshua at the Battle of Jericho? Why were we alluding to freedom from slavery if not because we were enslaved believing God's deliverance, right? These are then the underpinnings of what is not just black history, American history. And those things get lost, and again, and in that vacuum, things happen. So in answer to your original question, John, education is our first step. And we found that as I know who I am as a black man, how can I stand in solidarity with anybody, Jewish, Hispanic, whatever, if I don't know who I am? If I'm confused about my own identity and my history, or it's been told to me by somebody who doesn't know, who I didn't even exist in the history books until you did the chapter on slavery, how there were no black people until slavery was invented, right? So what does that do to a child in the third grade? It makes him very self-conscious of the fact that he's reading this book, and they said nothing about him until you got to slavery, right? So for those kids then who understood who they were before you got to that stupid chapter in that book, he already has context about who he is. That book doesn't define his identity or his history. Much of what's happening now, what's being poured into this chasm that it, the anti-Semitism is filling, is a lack of understanding, a lack of history, a lack of that type of knowledge. Our first step is education. Um, and, to, and to move forward, and, and you can, you know, I guess maybe both answer for your own community, what, what can Jewish Americans do to better to stand up to racism, and what can black Americans do to better stand up to anti-Semitism? <laughs> well, I think uh, Jews have been standing up to racism for the last uh, century. I mean, we really have been in the forefront of, uh, of civil rights, civil rights laws uh, for blacks, because uh, we know when the David Dukes and the Ku Klux Klan uh, condemns blacks, in the same sentence, they condemn Jews. We're really in the same boat when it comes to uh, uh, to this sort of uh, discrimination uh, uh, that we uh, endured here in America. <laughs> and uh, I'll tell you, one of the things I've done is I've, I've reached out. Uh, I mean, one of the problems are these rappers, these black rappers. Uh, I don't think they're that sophisticated, and they make extraordinary numbers of statements that are extremely hostile to Jews. I reached out to Ice Cube one of the famous uh, black rappers and actors. <laughs> we talked a lot about the Jewish-black relations, about Jews, and uh, I had him come to my dinner and publicly condemn anti-Semitism. Uh, and he said he's gonna be introducing me to other rappers to try to educate them about the, 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 the truth about Jews and not all these lies that they've heard uh, from Farrakhan and uh, Jackson and, and uh, Jeffries and others. So I think, uh, <laughs> Uh, you know, that's one of the things uh, I, I, I guess that uh, help Jews and to, uh, uh, 
I, I, maybe I'm wrong, I haven't felt that much racism among most Jewish people toward blacks. Uh, that, that has not been my experience. My experience has been enormous uh, feeling of empathy and, uh, uh, and really uh, similar experiences uh, when it comes to black, black Jews, when it comes to black people. <laughs> And uh, 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 that's what, one of the reasons I think Jews vote Democratic and not Republican. They think that's the best way to, uh, uh, to have more laws in place to protect people from discrimination. So uh, I, I'm not sure what else that Jews can do. We've, uh, we've done quite a lot. I'm proud, I'm proud to, uh, to say that. I want to, when I said this earlier um, about the rap artists or the hip hop, he didn't use this term about community. There is some anti-Semitism that's here. I want to go back to what I said <laughs> in the beginning. It's not the vast majority. Unfortunately, from some loud voices, we talked about the whole Kanye West situation just a few months ago, going from criticizing Jews and Jewish businesses to <laughs> admiring Adolf Hitler, the whole thing, Nazi, all that, right? To calling for murder. He called for murdering Jews. Death con, death con, death, death, death con, D E A T H. Right? And death so, con. and there's been all the debate what he, what he mean by this. And every time there were those who gave him the opportunity to kind of get off ramp, he would double down, right? Yeah. Double down, double down, double down. And who defended him? Candace Owens. Oh, yeah. I still don't understand that. This fabulous woman who I know personally, who's been great on all the issues, is starting to. Defend Kanye West. I can't explain that. I use the Kanye West thing as an example. Our organization put out a, an official statement about that, uh, about from the very beginning as it was happening. And sadly, again, does it represent the majority of the hip hop community? No. But what it does represent is those, those types of statements being said and the lack of pushback. Right. This has been the main thing. Yes. The, the one of the main mm -hmm. missing elements, and you can go back again to the '70s on this, is that. When there would be voices in the black community, again, they, never, they didn't represent the majority of the black, black Americans, but when there would be the anti-Semitism, there unfortunately wasn't enough of the pushback. That's why I went back to the whole Black Americans Support Israel community organization that was started in 1975. It was a response to what was actually happening in terms of anti-Semitism, anti-Zionism, those types of things. So the reason I brought that up with hip hop is that they're extremely, and I pushed back a couple of things more, uh, extremely sophisticated, very intelligent, very capable. Um, the artists, entrepreneurs, all of those things. You have to understand that when it comes to that type of anti-Semitism that we're talking about, because it be has become such an intellectual exercise, people with PhDs and all other kind of letters that follow their names, who have majored in things like the Jews have done this and the Jews have done that, insert whatever horrific thing, right? This is what you're talking about, very sophisticated people, very educated people, trafficking in propaganda. There was an Arab-Israeli journalist um, who traveled to Israel in 2000, traveled to the United States in 2009, born and raised in Jerusalem, who came to do a series of lectures in the United States. He was not able to speak in any campus because by the time the protesters had come, and he had always 10, 12 deep, either police officers or security officers because it was a big brouhaha everywhere that he went. He went back home, wrote an article. His name is Khaled Abu Tuame. He wrote the article. Great. And it was called On Campus, the real the kind of holding issue. Of, and again, it's inextricably linked, the issue of on the campuses. And he talked about the fact that he has spoken literally all over the world the Arab world, the Arab Muslim world. Uh, he, he's spoken in, throughout Europe, European Union, everywhere. Everywhere, he's a world leading journalist. He's been doing this for decades. When he first started journalism, he was working as part of Yasser Arafat's press corps, right? This is, this is where he cut his teeth. And he kind of left that job when he realized that he wanted to actually tell news and not just report what they were telling the report. I bring that up for this reason. He was so concerned with the level of hatred in Anamaz. This is an Arab Muslim journalist. He doesn't consider himself a Zionist. He lives in Israel. He defends Israel, but he does it as a practical thing. Hey, I live here. My family lives here. We have freedom of religion. We have free. He was so concerned that he said, number two things. Number one, never doing that again. I'll travel everywhere else and speak. Abu Dhabi, you name it, right? I'm not going to the States. I'm paraphrasing. These people are whack. And then he said, we should not be surprised. I can almost quote it by verbatim now. 
If the next jihadist comes not from the mountains of Afghanistan or Pakistan or from the Gaza Strip, but from US college campuses. This is an Arab Israeli journalist. He said this in 2009. His warning was, it's not, to, again, he's not coming from the position of, you know, Zionism or waving the Israeli flag. He's coming from the position academically of, let's have this conversation while I'm injecting it now. He's referring to Israeli Palestinian conflict. But he's talking about the Jew hatred on the campus. See, they're inextricably linked. He's talking about, I came to give lectures. I know what I'm talking about. At least listen to me if you want to debate me. Debate me. No. They shut me down. They chased me over everywhere. I got back on a plane and came back home. That's much of where we are here today. So let me turn to this. What can the Jewish community do? Jewish or non-Jewish? Stop turning a blind eye to the indoctrination that's going on on these campuses. Stop calling it progressive when it's not actually a debate. Stop calling it human rights if you're not listening to both sides. Stop demagoguing. So what can all the communities do? Be honest. Be real about what's actually going on. Stop covering your eyes. Stop acting like you don't see it. Stop acting like this is not happening. I said that for all of those who did their hand wringing and pearl clutching about what Kanye West said, there are professors who are saying almost similar things in co on college campuses across the country every day, brainwashing thousands of kids. Where is your outrage about that? And so one of the things that our organization did, we called out the BS. For example, when Kylie Irving was then deemed by both the NBA and Nike for posting a link to the Hebrew to Negroes film, which we watched, we analyzed, and absolutely, let me say this about the black Hebrew Israelites, there's more than one group. There's different sects of them, right? Not all of them are by, there's a small percentage that are the radical, the ones that we're more just talking about, but unfortunately, they are the ones in the headlines, and they are the ones in terms of bad things happening, making it bad for people, people like Rabbi Capers Fune, who's over the Israelite Board of Rabbis based in Chicago, has a wonderful relationship with the Jewish community. So when he sees those things, he's having to condemn those people who are using that term for hatred, right? The reason I bring it up is this. It was the first time that our organization publicly chided a, a Jewish organization. <laughs> And that was the ADL. The Anti-Defamation League, Nike, and the NBA all made a huge thing about what Kanye, Kyrie Irving had done. And our organization condemned it. We saw the film. It's very anti-Semitic, right? There's a lot of false academia that's in there. We can have a whole discussion about that. We've been studying this for a very long time, right? So they used him, I say used, as a scapegoat because although what he did was bad and you on the NBA, right? It's, it's the most visible sports league on the planet. It is a world stage. So whether you're black, white, or whatever, if you post something on your social media that's controversial enough, you're gonna cause a certain amount of controversy to come to you. That is what it is, right? It's a big boys league, right? Our concern was that there are much more pertinent and greater threats to the Jewish people anti-Semitism and the furthering of racism that the NBA and the ADL are completely fine with. So our concern is, why are you singling out him and not dealing with all these other things? We cry foul. Not that we didn't deal with this, deal with this. But don't act like, for example, you don't see what's going on in these campuses. Kylie Irving is not somebody's professor, having thousands of students every week indoctrinating them, but you say nothing about that. And we said you are using them as a scapegoat. Why? Because you have the glamour and the glitz of the NBA and Nike, and you get clicks and likes and donor dollars. We said, we will not allow these things to be used in that way. If you're not, if you're going to really fight it, fight it to our leaders all the time. Real leaders do the work. You're going to fight against racism, you're going to fight against anti-Semitism, then be real and honest and call it out where you see it, not where it's beneficial to you. And that was part of the issue to answer your question, John. What can both communities do? For my brother, Jewish brothers and sisters and others, call it out. As one is saying, call, when you see it, call it out. Don't selectively call it out. Don't call it out when white men are walking around with tiki torches talking about Jews will not replace us. And not say anything if they're Arab Muslim children on campuses walking around Palestinian flags saying, Intifada, Intifada, we demand the Intifada. Call out both or shut up. Call out both. 
or act like you don't see either one of them. Don't choose the one that actually makes you feel better about yourself. And that's what our organization attempts to do. On the right side of the aisle, the left side of the aisle, we don't care. Black, white, whoever they are, here's what's going on, and here's why it's a threat to everybody. Well, we, we Jews have a fear of calling out Arab and black anti-Semitism. Uh, for example, the Jews said nothing about Ra'am, a viciously anti-Semitic anti-Israel group that was part of the government last time, and they were afraid if they call them out and condemn them, they'll be called anti-Arab. And when it comes to Black Lives Matter, which is a group that does not represent uh, American blacks, Black Lives Matter Charter says that the Jewish state of Israel is a genocidal apartheid state, that Israeli police train American police to murder blacks. That's in the Black Lives Matter Charter. When Black Lives Matter came to the fore two and a half years ago, before these uh, uh, demonstration riots around the country, <coughs> I wrote an article exposing Black Lives Matter, saying nobody should support them, we should condemn them, because of their charter. I just put down facts. And do you know what happened to me after writing that? 51 heads of Jewish organizations signed a letter calling me, Morton Klein, a racist, and I should be thrown out of every Jewish uh, organizational group, every Jewish umbrella group. They didn't refute a single thing I said. I only copied what was on their charter. <laughs> and Jews are so afraid to call out uh, uh, black or Arab anti-Semites uh, uh, that instead they'll attack those who do call them out. Uh, uh, and uh, when I demanded, why are you allowing them to call, say, Israel's a genocidal state? In 1948, there were 150,000 Palestinian Arabs in the state of Israel. Today, it's going from 150,000 to 2 million Palestinian Arabs in the state of Israel. Whoever is in charge of Israel's genocide program has to be fired immediately. It's not working. It's not working. <laughs>